Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Illinois FAST Center webinar today on reauthorization and changes to the SBIR and STTR program for small businesses in the U.S. We're excited to have you today, and we have a stellar lineup of speakers to help provide their expertise, who we will be introducing to you. Before we get started, I just wanted to give a reminder that we are recording today's session, and so you will see that we will be trying to share out this recording with participants soon after the session. Please use your mute button throughout um, this workshop, but use the chat if you'd like to add a question and we will come back to you. And if you wanna come off of mute and introduce yourself at that time, um, we will be primarily relying on chat though, because we have so many speakers that are joining us today. So I'm gonna get started and tell you just a bit about the FAST Center as well. The FAST Center is here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and we are pleased to be serving companies throughout Illinois, entrepreneurs and inventors with SBIR and STTR assistance. We do this through the generous support of the US Small Business Administration and help to make America Seed Fund, SBIR and STTR programs available to more entrepreneurs that maybe are not familiar with the program, just getting started, or already have awards and need assistance with managing their awards and reaching commercialization. In addition to today's workshop, we have monthly webinars, so please join us in future sessions. And we have training workshops. If you want to do a more intensive type of experience, you can sign up for those as well. In fact, we have one upcoming in going into the, the winter season for NIH. So I know we'll be talking about NIH funding today. If you want to participate in a sprint or cohort experience, you can sign up for those when they become available. And I'd like to thank our colleagues from NSF who have helped us with past uh, formats along those lines as well. If you're new to SBIR and STTR, you're going to learn a little bit more about the program today, but we have 101 regular content and we have one-on-one -on -one technical assistance that we can provide for free to help you with your submission, help you select the solicitation, help you with your budget and many things that come up throughout the process. So thank you for being interested in SBIR funding and learning about changes that have come with reauthorization. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Bill Rush from Lewis Burke and Associates. We've had the pleasure of working with their firm for many years and providing federal advocacy for the University of Illinois on the Hill and helping us stay in tune with what's happening in the legislative cycle and agency priorities. Bill is an expert in commercialization. He is the chair of the technology-based economic development practice group within Lewis Burke, and he works um, in science and tech policy. And so we asked Bill to give us kind of the lay of the land of what's happening in reauthorization and a little bit maybe of the backstory of how we got to reauthorization because it was not an easy process, but we're very happy to be celebrating today and having so many agency experts and program leads and managers joining us to help provide their specific agency expertise. Bill, thanks for, thanks for doing this today. Thank you, Laura, and thank you everyone for participating today. Uh, as Laura had mentioned, um, I work at Lewis Burke Associates, who works at the University of Illinois for several years now as partners out here in Washington. Uh, we also work for several other uh, universities, research institutes, nonprofit research groups, and those associated with science and technology. So we have expertise really across the firm uh, in uh, everything that you would imagine a university would care about, from Department of Defense to the National Institutes of Health, uh, all the way to tech-based economic development, which has been my beat for just about the last seven years or so. So this is not my first, uh, and it will probably not be my last SBI or STTR reauthorization. Um, and we're really excited to talk to you all about it today. So if you can please go to the next slide. Great. So again, for today's discussion, um, we really want to dive in a little bit more to the SBI or STTR reauthorization. Uh, we know that this is a relatively steady program, uh, typically outside of maybe different set-asides or administrative functions when it comes to supporting uh, ecosystem development and participation in the program. There really aren't too many big changes to these initiatives. Uh, a few of those are coming through this recent reauthorization effort, and I know there has been some efforts by SBA and a few other stakeholder groups to try to convey some of those changes. Um, but we all thought it'd be a great idea to check in right now with all of you as real stakeholders in this program to better understand really what are the changes now, what is to be expected down the line, where are those changes going to be coming from, and what is to be expected. So we have a really great lineup today, starting with Eric Page Littleford uh, from SBA to talk exactly about those changes and what's been proposed in the legislation from the SBA perspective, which will have a very unique 
role as the overseer of all the different SBIR, SDTR programs of different agencies in the administration of some of the changes from the legislation. Uh, that will be followed by a brief uh, specific Q&A for Eric. And then we're going to turn it over to different agency briefings. So we have three of some of the top SBIR, STTR programs. And we feel like this is a good time where, you know, in some circumstances, they don't know exactly where the changes are going to be coming from, from the legislation. A lot of these, as you'll learn, are going to take several months to try to typically implement and create at the different agencies. But there's a lot going on in this space right now. So as we go into the end of the year and into the new year, this is an excellent opportunity for the folks on these different individual agencies, the Department of Defense, National Institutes of Health, and National Science Foundation to talk a little bit more about not only their SBIR programs, but other initiatives that may be supporting those, as well as any changes or interesting uh, opportunities coming ahead in the months uh, leading into 2023. Now, one last thing before we move on is that we also discussed this potentially being part one of a two-part series. So I'm not putting everyone on the call on the hook for this, but uh, again, as you'll see, today we wanna go over what uh, some of the basis is for these changes to these programs. But further down the line in the next several months, you're gonna to start to see some different agencies begin to have guidance and implementation strategies, at which point it might be a good time to check in with you all. Uh, so please look out and it will not be a repeat of this if you see it on your calendar uh, for a similar conversation several months down the line. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think it's really helpful to first go over the political context of the SBI or STTR uh, reauthorization. I think that maybe some of you are reading about it, maybe some of you weren't and are the fortunate ones, uh, but it was a really prolonged process. And I think that that really started to generate some questions as to the viability or the interest in Washington over these programs. And I think before we really get into this conversation, it's important to really understand kind of how we got here, uh, again, before we kind of dive, dive into that. But first and foremost, uh, the SBIR and STTR Extension Act of 2022 became law on September 30th, the very last day it could possibly become law before the programs would have lapsed. So Congress took their good time in getting that across the goal line. Uh, but again, a lot of work went into that process, which we'll discuss as well. So SBIR, STTR, and all associated pilot programs. Many of you are familiar with the pilot programs have been extended uh, for the next three years through September 30th, 2025. Now, there have been no changes to the set-asides to budgets. Usually, those who took this thing very often understand that there's sometimes additional funding for SBR, STTR. Sometimes more of the extramural budgets are going to the program. That was not really on the table this time in these current negotiations. It's going to be the same set-asides from the different agencies to support the program. Uh, it's important to also note that there is bipartisan support for SBIR and STTR. This has not changed. Uh, if you can see, the final bill did pass with 400 uh, 15 votes in the House. Uh, it also passed with unanimous consent in the Senate. So significant uh, support for this. However, there was a vocal minority of senators who were well positioned on the small business committees who did have some concerns. So these concerns really did dig up the process because their votes were essential for this get over the goal line. Again, a lot of you all should feel supported. You're well supported. A lot of agencies went to bat for the programs, a lot of different advocacy groups. I know some of you as well might have asked your members of Congress. And for that, I think it's, it's really important that you did that and to look out for doing that going forward. But that said, these concerns are really evident in some of the changes we saw. So it's kind of important, perceived, fair, unfair, whatever they were, but these were some of the main concerns that were outlined, I think, by some of the lawmakers who were looking for some reforms. And that was the multiple recipients of awards, this concept there might be some SBIR, STTR mills, where those who are winning over and over again, uh, federal return on investment in the programs, some concern with reporting requirements, maybe those are not really commercializing technologies quickly enough or well enough, they wanted to look into that. And then again, some potential security lists. So some of these are really tied in across the board, but I do think that these are some of the three concerns. When you hear Eric talk about them, that's kind of where you can understand where these are coming from. They're not out of left field. There is some context for this. Uh, again, extensive negotiation, a lot of work went into this. And what they're trying to do here, it seems to be, is to tee up another more comprehensive reauthorization down the line. So while there are some changes this time around, they could even inform more changes going further. So it's really important for you to stay in contact, keep track of what you think is working, what isn't working. They do like to hear from stakeholders. It's going to be really important when it does come either in the next three years or sooner for you to be able to speak to these programs, to these efforts, how these changes have affected you and more, anything else you might want to see in the program. So again, in the months ahead, SBA is going to be issuing some guidance and some of the agencies are going to be carrying those out, but it will be a long prolongated process. But you know, by this time, definitely by the end of next year, 
we're going to know exactly where we stand in these programs. So I think it's really important today to dive right into it. And with that, um, we're going to turn it over to Eric. But I do want to mention before we do actually is that for Q and A, um, we're going to hold until the end of individual presentations to actually ask questions. So if you can, I think there's a raise hand function or to please ask your questions in the chat and we'll, we'll get to those uh, at the different breaks between the sessions. So um, Eric, I think you're on, if you can take it away and, and switch over the next slide. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Bill, thank you so much uh, for that context and the backdrop. I think it was a great way to sort of frame uh, this initial part of the conversation. Um, so my name is Eric Page Littleford. I am actually the uh, program manager within the Office of Investment and Innovation for the SBIR and the SCTR program. Over this last year, I was the senior technology policy advisor, so that was the role I had living through the reauthorization process, but uh, I've taken on a new role uh, within the agency. So uh, next slide, please. Great. Um, so anytime I have the opportunity to talk about SBIR, SCTR, although we're going to focus on the changes in the reauthorization, it's always important to sort of start with the overall value proposition of the program, right? Uh, America Seed Fund provides non-dilutive funding for innovative companies to pursue technologies that have the potential for commercialization. So fundamentally, I think it's always relevant to understand what this really does in terms of this contribution uh, to innovators, its contribution to economic development, its contribution to the nation. And that's why I think you saw ultimately that significant bipartisan support when the bill was actually passed uh, roughly 75 days ago. All right, so next slide. All right, so one, um, and Bill sort of touched on this. So SBA, we actually have uh, the role of coordinating the SBIR and STPR programs across the 11 participating federal agencies. Um, our major responsibilities include one, oversight and policy guidance for the program. Uh, that's one of the reasons we're gonna talk about the reauthorization today. Uh, we also independently monitor uh, the agencies. We develop policy around the program and we're often on the, uh, on the hook uh, for reporting to Congress around how the program is actually uh, executing. We were happy to participate because, you know, this is actually one of our resource partners through our FAST program. Um, so, you know, we manage a number of funding programs to really try to build that broader ecosystem to make sure that our innovative entrepreneurs have the opportunities to really pursue their technologies. Uh, that's our FAST program, as well as our Growth Accelerator Fund competition. I will note, I saw in the chat that some of the people participating weren't necessarily companies, but other support organizations. Um, our Growth Accelerator Fund competition is a prize competition, and we actually recently announced, our administrator announced the next version of that for fiscal year 23. So I encourage you all to visit sbir.gov to get more details on that and maybe an opportunity to sort of help strengthen uh, the ecosystems you all support. We also provide training uh, to our resource partners, state economic development organizations, universities, uh, PTACs, which were recently renamed, uh, I believe they're uh, Apex Accelerators now, um, as well as other resource partners within the SBA framework. And one of the things we've really tried to do over the last five or six years is really lead the coordination of some of the outreach initiatives across the agency. So I'm actually happy uh, that I'm uh, participating in this with some of my colleagues with uh, NSF, DOD, and HHS. Right. Next slide. Okay, so the SBR SCTR Extension Act of 2022. So what I'm gonna really focus on are the components that are gonna most directly impact small businesses uh, in terms of participation within the program. There are other elements uh, in the bill uh, that I'll be happy to address via Q&A, but I think these are gonna be the areas that are gonna be most relevant to sort of our conversation. So one, it extends the program, right? So Bill talked about that, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, two, you know, in terms of that framework of, you know, research security, one of the things it does do is really focus a lot on disclosures related to foreign control and influence. Um, it does require uh, a, a, a different focus in terms of uh, security risks, potential security risks that could be uh, presented by various applicants, right? So there's a major due diligence effort. Um, the bottom two are elements that actually do make programmatic changes uh, to a degree. Uh, one is that within the Department of Defense, uh, they're going to be required to do uh, open topics, which we'll discuss a little bit more. And then with the multiple award winners, uh, it has sort of increased their performance standards uh, relative to the number of awards that they have received. So that's the broader framework. Uh, I've included a link 
uh, to the actual public law. I think if you, um, you know, if you've never sort of read uh, legislative texts, you know, it's always an interesting experience with coffee uh, to sort of see how that's, uh, how that's done. All right, next slide. Great. So here's the key, right? It does fundamentally extend the program and all of its pilot initiatives for the next three fiscal years. Uh, so I think this sort of builds on what Bill indicated. It's a rare, it's a short, shorter extension, right? Three fiscal years. Uh, a number of the changes that have been made to the program are pilot changes. Uh, there's a number of reporting elements that are going along with these pilot changes. A lot of tasking with the uh, GAO, the Government Accountability Office, uh, where we all can kind of learn. Uh, see how these pilots are taking root, and then possibly Congress can consider making changes. But the core of it for us is it does extend the programs for the next three years. And what that really means is that the opportunity that America C Fund provides is still in place, still fully uh, available uh, to our innovators, right? Because on average, we're funding 4,000 companies a year. Uh, that's roughly $4 billion across the 11 participating agencies. And that true value proposition with SBR, SCTR, uh, there is, you get to retain all your IP and intellectual property rights. So that's the real key part of the, of the extension that it keeps the program going for the next three fiscal years. All right, next slide. All right, so now we get to some of the changes. Um, so like I said, one of the things that the extension does is it is requiring that proposers, applicants as a part of the application process for whether it's a SBR, STTR award across the phases. They have to provide disclosures regarding potential areas of foreign influence or foreign control. Um, what you see on the left underneath the disclosures, this is not verbatim text, right? I think it's important to note that. Uh, ultimately, the individual guidance will be coming out in solicitations from agencies and later this year, uh, more broader guidance will be coming out probably from, uh, from SBA as well. Um, but these are the areas that the disclosures are looking to cover. Um, it's looking to see if anyone's a party to a foreign talent recruitment program, uh, of, and it has these terms, foreign countries of concern. So within the statute, it identifies four uh, foreign countries of concern, as well as others determined by the Secretary of State. So it's going to be a broader list. Um, it's looking for both business relationships, uh, funding, right? All those elements that could lead to some concern around control. I think the key thing I want to share here is as we're all working through this, all the agencies are working through this, uh, in terms of what that process will fundamentally look like, um, is this. The disclosure of these elements do not in and of themselves make anyone ineligible, right? You're still eligible, right? What this is really saying is let's just be clear on all the relationships so everyone can fully understand the potential implications of those relationships. In many instances, if you uh, disclose something in one of these areas, it may not necessarily be a real area of concern, and it may not have no, no implication in terms of potential award uh, decisions. In some instances, it may, right? So one of the potential impacts of this is there is the potential that an award may be denied based on certain relationships, right? So here's the key. I'm just giving a few examples. The real underlying you know, motivations be, behind this is that broader research security, right? So if there are certain relationships that pose a risk, to national security, that's one of those areas where it may result in an agency deciding they can't move forward with an award. Um, there's also the, the possibility where things aren't accurately or, or clearly or fully disclosed, right? That can also lead to that area. So one of the things that we're always going to tell people, uh, anytime you're applying for federal funding, SBR, SCTR, you know, just be truthful, be honest before coming, disclose as it relates to their guidance, um, and then allow the process to sort of go from there. Um, one of those other areas, and this is new for SBR, SCTR, is there's the potential where a company may have to repay funds received under an award. Now, here's the key, uh, and I don't want to scare anyone here, right? Um, it's really if there's changes or mis material misstatements or misrepresentations that pose a risk to national security. So that's sort of the under underlying you know, thought process here is really what we're trying to do is protect the overall research security infrastructure. Um, and if there are things that pose a risk to national security, there may be repercussions, there may be act actions or activities that the agency may have to pursue. Um, but that's one of the major changes uh, with this particular uh, extension is that focus. And although it's 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 within the SBR, SCTR statute, um, going back to, I believe, January of 2021, there's been a federal 
policy, a federal memo, focused more broadly about uh, the national uh, protecting uh, resource security across the federal agencies. And every you know major legislative bill related to R and D, we've seen language uh, related to trying to strengthen that. Um, so you know SBIR, STTR, that language is now sort of being incorporated there, and we're going to be working through that process. Next slide. All right. So there's really is a two part dance. So there's disclosures, right, in terms of sharing of those relationships. But the other thing is looking at that broader security potential um, concerns is a broader due diligence uh, effort um, that agencies are going to be undertaking here. Um, it's really going to be looking at, and I like to highlight this, a risk based approach. And what I really think that means is this while these programs are being developed, uh, in some instances, they are being modified. Ultimately, all the agencies will have until June of 2023 to sort of at least have their initial version of these programs implemented. The risk-based approach as appropriate is basically going to say not every program will look the same, right? The agencies are different. Their funding priorities are different. The technology areas are different. The size and number of uh, grantees and awards are different. So all of these won't necessarily look the same. The elements, though, in terms of the types of things they will need to consider looking at will, will roughly be the same, right? So one is cybersecurity, uh, looking at the cybersecurity practices. Now, these are under development, so that could be training, that could be certification, that could be guidance, that could be a lot of different things. So I'm not, you know, at this point sort of defining what that will look like, uh, but it's the types of elements they're going to be exploring. Patent analysis, employee analysis, and once again, focusing on potential concerns around foreign ownership or foreign influence. Um, and I mentioned those disclosures earlier. There's another element of this is to, you know, to the extent that's, you know, reasonable and, and, and applies to that risk-based approach, looking for the potential non-disclosure of information, right? So what does that really mean? It means that ultimately we should be truthful, honest, and disclosed if, if there are known relationships um, that require disclosing. Right. One thing that's a bit new uh, is it allows up to 2% of the SVR program budget uh, to be used to fund this, right? Because these are going to be new activities. Um, so we're, we're, we'll see what that, is, what that ultimately looks like in terms of the overall impact. impact. Um, so this is sort of the due diligence program. I will share this. While these programs are still being developed, a uh, number of the agencies throughout this process, you know, it's not viewing this as a you know, a, a necessarily pass fail, right? So in terms of, you know, cybersecurity, oh, I, 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 if a company doesn't have, say, the strongest practices in place, it's not necessarily meaning that you won't be able to receive an award. Uh, mitigation and education is some of the things that people are really thinking about. You know, how do you supplement? How do you mitigate potential risks? How do you mitigate potential concerns? So I think they're all approaching this in a manner consistent with how they've approached the implementation of their programs. This is a valuable program for innovative small businesses. What can we do to help and facilitate within the framework of our requirements? All right, so I don't want you to be scared away uh, because of this. Right? Um, there are a few areas, and this is sort of gets to some of that broader additional guidance that's probably going to be coming down the pipeline over the coming months, is the statute does make clear uh, there are opportunities to sort of work, understand best practices, share some of those best practices across the agency uh, community, um, and I will note that within the framework of due diligence, if you think about those disclosures I talked about earlier, those disclosures don't touch on things that will address the cybersecurity practices, right? So there is the potential that additional uh, information or additional uh, factors will be considered or requested from companies when they're applying um, going forward. So that's something that fundamentally, to the extent that those different elements are required, It'll be, you know, defined in the solicitations. You'll have plenty of time to understand what they're going to be looking for uh, and to be able to sort of provide that. But we do recognize that with the disclosures, it's going to probably require additional information beyond just what's on the basic disclosure form. All right. Next slide. All right. So this is one where it is a uh, programmatic change. Um, so what this is basically doing is requiring the Department of Defense uh, at least once per fiscal year is to sort of have an open topic concept within their uh, components. I don't, I, I doubt, uh, I, I shouldn't speak for Susan, but I doubt Susan is gonna be in a position to sort of speak about this today. Um, I am signaling it because it's in the legislation. Uh, it requires some 
mechanism implementation by March of 2023. Um, and this, this could look different if you've applied to some of the DOD components. Uh, historically, a lot of the DOD um, components or services have identified or signaled uh, capability gaps or get proposals outside of that. Uh, so this is sort of saying, hey, in addition to that, at least want to do a more open topic. So this is something that we'll be seeing and seeing how it impacts and changes um, the potential participants or the potential landscape within the uh, DOD portion of the program. All right, next slide. All right, so again, um, you know, and Bill sort of mentioned this, one of the other areas that they sought to strengthen was the performance benchmarks for multiple award winners. Uh, so fundamentally since 2011, uh, 2011 reauthorization, established performance benchmarks where we basically, if a company received a certain amount of phase ones within a five year period, it's gonna be over 20, uh, then there's certain standards that would apply if they receive more than uh, 16 phase twos within a 10 year period, um, then they had to average roughly $100,000 per phase two on average or have a patent for one out of every eight phase twos during that period uh, to continue to be able to receive proposals, you know, within the submit proposals within the program for the following year. So one of the things that you know, Congress decided to do was sort of to strengthen that as it relates to some of the more significant multiple award winners. So really, it's really two benchmarks. And what they basically did was one, any uh, company that's received more than 50 phase uh, one awards in the five year covered period, they basically have to transition at least half of that 50% of those awards to uh, phase two, right? So that's the phase one to phase two uh, transition rate. It basically doubled what the standard rate was, right? Uh, so now if you're over 50, it doubles it to, you know, transitioning 50% instead of the standard at 25%. And then it added sort of two tiers as it relates to that commercialization aspect, right? So if you've received a significant number of phase two awards, um, and it's really saying, can you demonstrate some of the commercial return on investment of those awards? So the first tier, is going to apply if a company received greater than 50 phase two awards in the 10 year cover period, they have to average now uh, $250,000 on average, right? For those awards during that cover period. If they have over a hundred phase twos during that 10 year period, the average then goes to $450,000. So it strengthens it. It's, it's, it's a, a larger threshold that they uh, have to demonstrate. Um, this is going to be taking effect basically uh, April um, of the coming year. Uh, and the key is one of the consequences now for these higher tiers is that they're going to be restricted to no more than 20 phase one, a uh, total 20 phase one or direct to phase two's awards from agencies, um, actually from each agency for the next fiscal year if they fail, right? So we will see in terms of the performance, but this is one of the mechanisms they put in place as it relates to multiple award winners to sort of strengthen um, the demonstration of the ROI. There's another element that we're going to, SBA will be providing further guidance on, uh, is the concept of a covered cell. So one of the things they did is sort of added this definition of a covered cell. Um, and this is sort of a summary you can sort of see on the slide. Um, in summary, it's basically a, if a, if, if a company is going to use a cell to meet the standard, right, and no portion of that cell was used with federal funds, and it happened five years before they're using it to meet the standards, they basically have to provide some documentation. Uh, so while we'll provide for the guidance to be an example, if you had a covered sale um, that was not user funding, maybe that documentation is a purchase order. Um, that could be an example, uh, or, or a paid invoice could be an example of that documentation. So this is new. Historically, uh, that level of documentation was not required. Uh, with the benchmark. So this is something that will uh, be different and new, but we'll be providing guidance. And I will note that the number of companies that trigger this is a relatively small number when you look at the 4,000 uh, companies you, that win awards every year. Uh, so what that really means is we have the opportunity to sort of really provide direct messaging and guidance to make sure everyone's aware uh, that this is going to apply to them and how they're gonna be able to um, satisfy uh, the reporting requirements. All right, next slide. All right, so yeah, again, so really those are the major changes that primarily are gonna impact uh, the small businesses. So I think with that, I'm happy to open it up to any questions. Thanks, Eric, that was incredibly helpful. Uh, and really substantive. I think this recording and your slides are gonna be really helpful for folks to refer to. So really extremely well done. Thank you so much for that. We do have a few questions in the, 
the chat right here. Uh, the first one is from Keenan Izal. Uh, how does Congress as SPA justify the 50% transition rate from phase one to phase two when agencies like the Air Force have a 20% transition rate that is planned? Yeah, I think that's a very good point, right? And I think throughout the process when they were trying to figure out how do you strengthen it, uh, a number of factors came into play, looking at what the current rate was, looking at what was uh, reasonable uh, given the understanding of data. I do, I do want to make, I guess, one note. When you look at those triggers, right, I think when you look at those triggers of saying that transition rate kicks in when a company has more than 50 phase one awards, right, it, it, it kind of balances out instead of what would traditionally be for a single company applied to a singular agency, you know, a singular year, right, where you see that 15 to 18% on average. The more awards that we've seen the companies win, in most instances, they actually do have fairly high phase one to phase two transition rates. Some companies we do anticipate will be impacted by this, however. Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 it's a really good question. Those are some of the thoughts, some of the considerations that went in. Great. And we also have a question from uh, David Tyler. Uh, out of how many SBA have over 50 phase ones? So think how many, out of interest, how many SBA have over 50 phase ones? So is this a common occurrence? I think is kind of the question. Is that something that you see often? And maybe yeah. Eric, you can describe a little bit. It's agency to agency. This is different DOD, which we're going to hear from versus NSF are quite different in the recurring awards. Sure, sure. So yeah, let me, I guess, frame that multiple award winner concept more broadly within the framework of SBIR.gov. Okay. So across SBIR.gov, I think, and if I think back to our last, you know, published annual report, roughly 1.2% percent of the companies had more than say 16 phase twos in a 10 year period, right? So relatively across the programs, a fairly small population. What happens in terms of the multiple award winners is for the most part, it's really a, a it's really occurs within our acquisition agencies. So Department of Defense, um, uh, NASA, uh, some of the smaller ones as well, Department of Homeland Security. And one of the reasons is they actually procure needs. Uh, they fund technologies in areas where they have technology gaps, they develop capabilities within these companies and these companies then provide you know, critical research and development as well as uh, phase three results from those. So when we looked at the data, it's gonna primarily impact, like I said, those agencies I mentioned in terms of the, where, where those companies are winning the majority of the awards. Now it also makes sense because DOD is half the program's budget, a little bit more than half, almost half the program's budget um, these days. Overall, the numbers are, are we talking uh, maybe a score, maybe 20 or so, they're gonna have the 50 within that time frame, within that five within that um, five year period. So it's relatively small. I, I should just make a plug for SBR.gov actually. So if SBR.gov, all this data is available, right? So one of the things you can do on SBR.gov, if you go to the site, look at our portfolio, look at the five years, and then you can do the numbers, right? And you can see how many companies are above uh, say 50 phase one awards over a five year period on SBR that goes. So all of this information is public in terms of uh, those that are gonna trigger the benchmarks. Got it, we have time for just uh, two more questions I would say. Uh, the first one is any idea how likely the new regulations are to affect the ability of foreign residents to work on an SBIR award? Yeah, so that's a really good question. That's one of the things that we're gonna be developing out through the policy. I will say this, at this point, the fundamental eligibility components have not changed, right? So in terms of who can who can participate on a project, who can serve as the principal investigator, those elements have not really changed. What we're really saying is in certain instances, you may have to provide more disclosures to understand if there are potential relationships that they may bring that could create conflicts of interest, interest or pose a risk, right? So that's what we, I think we, we have to see. But in terms of who can participate, what roles they can play, those items have not changed through this uh, extension act. Okay, we have one more, and I think they piggybacked on each other, and they're very similar to this last one. So, see if there's anything maybe different in in, in how you hear the answer. Is uh, will the STTR program require additional info from our university partners to fulfill the foreign disclosure requirement? Again, that's STTR program, uh, and then that mm -hmm. was piggybacked on to further this question: Are EU citizens limited in employment in SBIRs? Yes. Yeah, so, all right. So these are obviously very, very good questions. Yeah. 
I'm going to address the SATR one first. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those areas that is still being defined. I will give you an example where that additional information may occur, right? This is just an example. One of the things that the um, legislation does is it defines a, a, um, a covered individual, right? And it defines a covered individual sort of in two ways. One who say substantially contributes to the research and development that's a part of that definition or other key personnel. So if you think about STTR, right? In many instances that the research institution may be the project investigator lead, right? Which may signal the triggering of a covered individual. So in that instance, possibly. Um, fundamentally, I think the official guidance that's going to come out will sort of outline the key personnel in terms of who, you know, what information, information needs to be disclosed. Within that framework of disclosures, it's really about those underlying relationships. So I think what may really occur is more conversations between the small business and the partnering institution around potential concerns given the types of relationships that may need to be disclosed. So that's something we're gonna see. Um, so in terms of the EU citizens, limited employment and SBIRs. So that was that's gonna just basically be under the same guidelines of a foreign national being able to work on a project or you know, in terms of the their, their visa requirements and what roles they're gonna play, right? So if they're here, the r and is gonna be taking place in the US, it's by, there's no other restrictions given the type of technology it's being invested in. That's really going to govern that particular question in terms of the citizens being limited. Great. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, hope you'll stick around. Uh, this was extremely helpful. But now, again, we're going to try to move on to some quick hits from different agency representatives to talk a little bit more about their SBI or STTR programs, uh, what's new, what's to be expected. And I think we're going to kick it off with uh, Susan Solis from the Department of Defense. And apologies if I mispronounce your last name, Susan. Please take it away. No, can y'all can y'all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Am I coming through? Sounds great. Okay, excellent. Um, <clears throat> so I don't have any like slides specific to the reauthorization. This is my normal slide deck given the time it takes us to get things through our public affairs. But um, but if you want to go to the next slide, I will try to quickly um, kind of build on some of the things Eric talked about. Um, you know, go ahead to the next one. Some of these slides are obviously what, you know, Eric has already discussed, the, the, the method, you know, the program, it's, they've been around 40 plus years, et cetera, and, and these are very important programs to the department. And so you can imagine the, the huge collective sigh of relief that we all had when, <laughs> when they were reauthorized and there was no lapse, because that was something that we were really bracing for, um, for a few minutes there. Um, this is the mission of the department's SBRS TTR program, obviously, to take uh, the, the innovation from small businesses and transition them into uh, capabilities for the warfighter. That is our main, main mission. Next slide. And then our vision for our office, um, our office oversees the, the, the department's entire uh, program, um, is to be recognized across the, the DOD as an impactful source for the technological innovation and advanced capabilities to address national challenges. Um, and so obviously we have quite a huge program, as Eric mentioned, we're a little over half of the entire federal spaces programs. Um, and so again, this has been a, a program, both of these programs have been used by the department to provide uh, innovation to the warfighter to keep our, uh, our technological advantage on the battlefield. Next slide. Uh, let's see, these are, these are the goals. You've already heard these. You can go on to the next one. Okay, so here, I'll stop here. So this is a, an overarching process and all of the DOD agencies that participate in the programs. Um, there's approximately 13 to 16 agencies. Some of these have um, space development agencies now become part of the Air Force. So, um, so you'll see my slides get updated in the future with some of the, um, the reorganizations that have happened. Um, each one of these organizations participate in the DOD's program. And each one of them has their own budgets and their own missions that, that uh, meet the overarching DOD needs. It starts with a, a, a topic development process. Some of this is um, centralized and some of it is decentralized. So topic development occurs at each one of these organizations that you see on this chart. And then it becomes a centralized process where our office puts all together the broad agency announcements and we publish those. 
proposal submissions still centralized comes into our tools and then the proposal evaluation and selection processes is decentralized and it goes out to these organizations for their uh, evaluation and selection of proposals and then contract award and then reporting is a centralized process where we collect all the reporting and then we report it over to SBA. So one of the things I'll start with as far as the, um, the reauthorization. Uh, first of all, you know, obviously we, along with all the other agencies are working very closely with Eric and SBA to make sure that we comply with all of the new requirements that are in the, in the reauthorization language. Um, uh, and we will communicate with all of you as often and as early as we can about whatever changes that are about to be implemented. That will be through joining our listserv. There's a slide on here that gives you the link to our listserv. I recommend that you join that because it gives you a lot of great information and updates on not only about the new reauthorization, but, but all everything else that's going on in the program. And we also have a newsletter, a quarterly newsletter that we send out. So you'll have access to that. And then also through the broad agency announcement. So any language um, that we need to put in those announcements. Normally what we do is we send out a listserv. We tell you, you know, this announcement is about to come out and these are the changes to it. And that's under normal circumstances. So we will follow that same communication plan with uh, the, any changes that we're making in regards to reauthorization. Um, and we will highlight that as well. Um, I, I would like to say <laughs> that mills is not a term that I like to use because I feel like it, diminishes the contributions that those firms have made to the programs and to the department's technolo technological advantages. Um, we do not see uh, multiple award winners as an issue because uh, some oftentimes to, to get the department a capability, a mature capability in technology requires multiple awards to get it over the valley of death or to get through all of the uh, requirements that we need to make sure that that technology is safe and is ready for the for the warfighter. Um, so, and and the other thing that I think we tried to convey to Congress that I'm not really sure it was hard to tell whether whether it was clear or not was that just because a multiple award winner wins doesn't mean other companies didn't win for that same topic because each of the organizations that puts out topics oftentimes they're gonna they're gonna award more than one award to different companies. So let's just say a phase one or, or a topic had, um, I don't know, 30 proposals come in. They're probably gonna make three, maybe sometimes three or four or even more proposal awards for that topic. So it's not just the multiple award winner that's winning, it's a bunch of other companies too. And I think that maybe sometimes gets lost when a company is winning uh, uh, multiple awards. Um, Let's see, I just wanna make sure, I took some notes while Eric was talking so that I could, I could kind of um, piggyback on some of the things he was saying. Um, okay, so disclosure form, I think uh, Eric covered that when, when SBA's disclosure form is ready, that is that we will be using that like everybody else. We will put it in the BAA, we will notify everybody ahead of time. Um, the due diligence program. Now that's gonna be somewhat complicated because as you see, you have all these different organizations and we are trying to do one, unified comprehensive pro program for the department so that you're not getting different answers from different agencies about you know different different um, organizations here you're not going to get different answers and and different processes and all that so we're trying to come up with one unified process for the department um, and so we have representation we have a tiger team we put together and we have representation from all of these agencies plus others that need to be involved um, in the process to develop that process um, and so uh, we will let you guys know as soon as we can as eric mentioned that has to be rolled out by june of 2023 so we are trying um, you know as fast as we can to get something out but that's something that's thorough and something that's not going to leave gaps in the process um, open topics. Uh, Eric talked about that a little bit. Many of you on the line might have already responded to some of the AFWORKS uh, open topics that they've been putting out for the last few years. Um, we've had probably uh, a very small handful of other open topics that have been released by other organizations, Navy and Special Operations Command. Um, the main, the, my main goal is to make sure that each of these organizations 
that they have flexibility in their programs to run the program according to their mission requirements and their mission structure and their organizational structure. So, so the goal is not to be so prescriptive that, you know, but at the same time provide some kind of uh, overarching guidelines and um, guardrails, if you will, to make sure that we're not um, um, getting in too many proposals that, that really don't increase the amount of awards that get made. So, it, so it's very unlikely that you'll see a, a, a DOD-wide process that, that looks like the AFWORKS model, the current AFWORKS model. Um, and then lastly, I will say that the, um, the benchmarks, obviously we're going to follow SBA's guidelines because that's what we do now. So, um, so that'll be, that'll, that process will be very similar. It's just the benchmarks themselves are changing. Um, this is the, uh, thank you for advancing slide. So, so a lot of this thing, a lot of this slide, I think a lot of people already know the eligibility requirements, the program differences, um, these, uh, these guidelines on the right hand side are basically the caps that SBA sets for the programs. So it's really important to read the instructions of each of those agencies that was on the previous slide because they have they follow different um, guidelines for for funding requirements um, and again it's about flexibility to make sure that the the agencies can you know depending on their budget maybe they can't afford to give the full 275,000 for a phase one so that's why we believe in, in a lot of flexibility within our programs uh, next slide please Susan um, I'm sorry we have a uh... yeah. There's been so many like good uh, points, and thank you for responding to your authorization. Um, we're we're gonna have to move oh, yeah. on, I think, to the next one. That's okay. That's, Is that okay? That's fine. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely fine. Just let me know if you have any questions. I, I know seven minutes is is not a lot of time. I, I totally we, we know that now, so we'll definitely make it quicker next time around. Uh, I thought or, or, I thought reauthorization okay. might be a little more important for people to hear about than than. Oh. And then you can look at the, you can look at my standard slides and, and and people can email me or email our our or reach out to us if they have questions. Thank you so much, Susan. And please, if you want to drop your email in the chat, that'd be great. Uh, I know there's a few other questions in the chat, but um, uh, we're gonna have to move on uh, to uh, Stephanie. And, and thanks again, Susan. That was extremely helpful. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, uh, for joining us today. So we go to the next slide. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into a lot of specific details about our programs. And it's interesting, I'm coming right after the DOD because I think HHS, and my name is again, Stephanie Fertig, and I'm uh, with, not just with NIH, but I also help manage and lead the small business programs for HHS, Health and Human Services as a whole. And really, HHS is very different from the Department of Defense. If you want to see us, we're, we're extremely different. They tend to do uh, contracts. We tend to do grants. Um, so there's a number of uh, differences and we put a lot of information on our website. So you go to seed.nih.gov, wealth of information about our specific funding opportunities and our programs. Next slide. But I want to take my, uh, my five minutes today to really talk about some of those fundamental differences and then weave in a little bit of information about the reauthorization, although we're very much in early days. We utilize our small business programs to really help take those great innovations that are out there, that are being developed and get them into the hands of the patients, clinicians, caregivers, and researchers that need them. We're really here to help turn discovery into health. Next slide. Now, unlike the Department of Defense or even some of the other agencies, we tend not to be the final purchasers of the technologies that we're helping support and develop. We really fund those early stage technologies, again, that early in proof of concept or and onto the research and development with the idea that we're helping de-risk those technologies to get them to an inflection point, get them to the point where an investor or a partner may be interested in taking that technology all the way to the market. There are a few rare situations where we do help support something all the way to the market. But again, because of the area that we work in, oftentimes we recognize that either there's a partner or investor that's needed. Next slide.
All of our funding opportunities are available at c.nih.gov, and you can see front and center all of our open funding opportunities. The majority of our funding goes through investigator-initiated grant applications. We have open open grant um, uh, open uh, funding opportunities. So that idea of investigator-initiated, or you bring us your great idea. We've been doing that for quite some time, and that's actually, again, the majority of our applications and our grants are made through those open omnibus solicitations. We have three standard receipt dates, September 5th, January 5th, and April 5th. Now, it's important to note if there are any changes or any updates to our policies or how our program is going to be run, you're going to find that at seed.nih.gov. And so it's really important to take a look at our website. Also going to note that for the January 5th receipt date, we are business as usual. So there are no changes for the January 5th receipt date. If there are changes to a program announcement, we will put out a notice. So we will let the community know. And any changes to a program announcement are made 30 days prior to the receipt date. So again, no changes for January 5th at this point. Next slide. Most important piece of advice, you don't know who to contact, you're not sure uh, you know, if something applies or who to go to. You know, again, please talk to us at least a month before the application deadline. Unlike contracts, because we're mostly grants, you can come talk to us right up until the moment you hit the submit button, although I do encourage you to do it a little bit earlier. There's a number of ways you can determine who to contact. We do have a list on our website of the different individuals. And we have 27 different institutes and centers at the NIH. So you can take a look at the different areas that they cover. If you're still not sure, you can always email us. You see my email there, and I'll also pop it in the chat uh, just to make sure everybody gets that. And so again, please connect with us. There's a number of ways to do that. You know, Again, our website, email, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, we have a number of events. You can hear about the different opportunities, um, the different things we've got going on. Um, right now, I should, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that we did have a new funding opportunity released for the phase zero program that we have, which was also part of the reauthorization. It's a pilot program that was reauthorized. So I'm going to pop that into the chat as well. And that's specifically to support our phase zero hubs. So again, happy to take any questions. I know we're running a, a little over today, so I'll end there. Thanks, Stephanie. I just wanted to have a reminder, we will be running an NIH sprint for Illinois. So if you want to go through a cohort experience to learn and prepare you for an NIH application, look forward to those announcements coming from the FAST Center. All right, Bill, I think you're gonna introduce our next speaker from NSF, Eric. Yeah, Laura, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So right in the middle of this webinar, my internet crashed. So uh, <laughs> thank you all. This is how it is uh, in 2023 or 2022. So Eric, uh, thank you so much. Um, please take it away with the exciting new TIP directorate. No, no, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so for many of you, uh, you may have heard there's a new directorate at NSF now. It's called TIP, Technology Innovation and Partnerships. Um, this is the first new director in, in, at NSF for a little bit over the 30 years. So um, I'm talking about this today because I, from my conversations with people in the community, there's a little bit of confusion about what TIP is, how this relates to SBIR, uh, and, and how that would potentially impact the program going forward. So if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, these are just some statistics about NSF. No one's really interested in this right now. So you can go to the next slide as well. Um, these, the honeycomb pictures you see in the background here are the directorates within NSF prior to TIP. And so they've traditionally funded uh, pretty much all areas of science and engineering. Um, this is the fundamental research that you see here. In the past, the SBIR program has been part of the engineering directorate. It was a division within the uh, engineering uh, directorate, right, um, industrial innovation and partnerships, and SBIR was part of that. Um, recently, a new directorate was created, and this is the Directorate for Technology Innovation Partnerships. As I mentioned, this is cross-cutting interdisciplinary research. And so we see this as it's kind of encompassing all of the areas of science and engineering, which are traditionally funded by NSF, into a directorate which is really looking at use-inspired translational research. 
And so this, this line across this is, is supposed to represent this multidisciplinary approach uh, to uh, tackling some of these uh, use-inspired uh, translational research questions. Next slide, please. The main goals of TIP are accelerating his research to impact. And so this is done in a lot of different ways, some leveraging existing programs and some new programs which have been initiated and are in the process of being developed and, and published as well. Uh, the first mission is to foster innovation in technology ecosystems. This is uh, not just um, in specific areas of the country, but really to grow new translational and industrial um, uh, regions throughout the country that haven't necessarily traditionally had them. Um, so how can you foster regional innovation um, that can you know, focus on regional interests as well as uh, national and global um, uh, uh, issues as well uh, and support these ecosystems, uh, develop um, uh, uh, talent pools, ne next generation of uh, 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 employee uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, people working in, in, in the ecosystem, sorry, uh, um, and also establishing ways that you can translate these technologies uh, into new businesses and new products. And so this is uh, hopefully facilitating this on a multiple different levels, you know, creating these uh, ecosystems, these infrastructures uh, to develop these ecosystems, uh, facilitating ways to translate technologies from the people who are coming up with the ideas into potential uh, products and, and building uh, the next generation uh, of STEM leaders um, you know, throughout the, these different regions of the, um, the country and bringing in all areas of, of the population uh, to really tap into that diverse um, ecosystem and the, that diverse um, uh, STEM talent, which is out there in the country. Next slide, please. Uh, within uh, TIP, there are a number of different programs. There's two main divisions in the Innovation and Technology Ecosystems, or ITE. Uh, in the translational impacts, um, there are a couple of existing programs, as I mentioned, that have migrated over to TIP uh, within the ITE division, the Convergence Accelerator, which you know, looks at really multidisciplinary approaches to tackle different um, um, areas of need. Uh, there's a new regional innovation engines and the excellent program uh, within translational impacts. This is probably the area that, that most of you are most uh, uh, interested in uh, some existing um, programs which have migrated over there include the Partnerships for Innovation, which is uh, actually fundamental. Uh, it's, it's given to academic groups, people who have uh, NSF-funded um, basic research uh, and looking at ways that this can be translated. Uh, it's kind of, Some people think of it as kind of a, a pre-SBIR uh, uh, program, but it really goes to the academic group. It's an award to a university. Um, and then there's i -Corps, which many of you may have heard of. And then, of course, uh, SBIR, our seed fund um, powered by NSF. Uh, and then there are a couple other new translational uh, pathways which have been open as well. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on this. This is the SBIR program. I'm not going to really talk about reauthorization uh, too much, mainly because um, a lot of how that will change the program is yet to be determined. And we're waiting you know, for guidance from SBA and how to implement this, just echoing what a lot of other people said previously. Um, SBIR program at NSF mirrors NIHs a little bit more than DODs and that we're looking for very early stage technologies, uh, things which still have to develop that proof of concept, looking for high risk, high reward opportunities that can have societal benefit in the market that can really support that company to get that societal benefit. Um, so a lot of people wonder, do you need preliminary data? No, you don't. Um, we're looking for a very early stage. That, and the focus of phase one is to show that proof of concept. I often have companies that are, uh, they go and talk to a different government agency and they say, you know what, that's too risky for us. Why don't you go and talk to NSF? And that's really what NSF is looking for, that really early stage, uh, high risk, high impact uh, potential funding. Uh, again, we have a stage approach. Uh, phase one, 275K. Phase two is uh, a million uh, currently capped. There is no direct to phase two. Uh, all, you can only apply for phase two if you have a phase one award. And then there are some supplemental opportunities for phase two awardees as well. Um, some outputs that we see, um, this gives you an idea of the niche that we're uh, looking for. Every government agency has a niche. You saw that from DOD, you saw that from NIH, NSF as well. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is 95% uh, of the awardees have 10 or fewer employees. 81% were founded in the past five years. 59% were first time SBIR, SCTR awardees of any government agency. Uh, and over the past 10 years or so, maybe less than that, there's outputs have been about $14 billion in follow on institutional financing and 200 exits. And I will stop at there because I know I'm at time. 
and you can just scroll to the very end of the slides. Thank you so much, Eric. So again, huge, exciting news at NSF, not just SPIR, not just STTR, but this massive new ecosystem to support tech transfer, commercialization, use inspired research. A lot of new news is going to be coming out of the National Science Foundation going forward, in addition to some changes to the SPIR STTR program, which we'll see in the weeks ahead. So again, thank you so much, everybody. I know we're at time. We're going <laughs> to space out differently, but I think it was a very uh, helpful briefing. If you have any questions, the uh, Illinois FAST Center information is here. Uh, and thank you again for making time. I think it was a very informative conversation discussion. Thank you so much to our presenters uh, and everybody who helped work to get this uh, reauthorization over the hill. Everyone, the agencies on here worked extremely hard with Congress uh, to make sure this was known and their priorities were known and just tremendous work overall. So thank you so much for joining and we really appreciate spending time with you all. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Eric, Eric, Stephanie, and Susan. And a reminder, and I see our colleagues on from the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, we have a new phase one match in Illinois. So please apply for that phase one match, $50,000. They have a recent webinar you can watch, and we will help support you through the Illinois FAST Center in obtaining that matching funding. So thank you for everybody on reauthorization and providing your expertise today. This was recorded and we will share slides after this session with participants. Thank you.